السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف خلق الله وأعز المرسلين سيدنا ومولانا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين وصحبه الأخيار المنتجبين وعلى جميع الأنبياء والمرسلين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد يقول الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وقل جاء الحق وزهق الباطل إن الباطل كان زهوقا صدق الله العلي العظيم Allah says in the Holy Quran what translates to and say the truth has now come and falsehood has withered away for behold all falsehood is bound to wither away one thing I thought to start this short talk with is to ask a question and that is usually when we read the Holy Quran how do we read it meaning when we read stories of previous nations that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about, when we read stories of prophets, when we read examples that Allah gives us from history, how do we read these? Do we read them like we're reading a book of history, of stories that are being told to us to entertain us, maybe learn a lesson and move on? Is that really the book that is supposed to guide us until the day of judgment? Until the end of time, which we don't know when it will be. It might be a hundred years, might be a thousand years, might be a million years. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us a story in a particular point in time in the past. Is it for it to stay in the past? For example, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وقالت اليهود ليست النصارى على شيء وقالت النصارى ليست اليهود على شيء وَهُمْ يَتْلُونَ الْكِتَابِ Translation. And the Jews say that the Nazarene or the Christians have no basis in their beliefs, in what they believe. And the Nazarenes or the Christians say that the Jews have no basis in their beliefs. Excommunication. While they <coughs> read the scripture. وَهُمْ يَتْلُونَ الْكِتَابِ They both read the scripture. Yet they both excommunicate each other, saying, this person, whatever they believe, it doesn't make sense. Huh? Allah continues and saying, the claim of those, this is the claim of those who have no knowledge. Those who talk like this are people of no knowledge, are people of ignorance. Right, so I read this verse and I say to God, Oh Allah, thank you. You told me that, you know, this was what the Jews used to say to the Christians back then. This was what the Christians used to say to the Jews back then. I'm, I'm, alhamdulillah, I'm safe. That's it. I learned something about something happened in the history. Or do I not learn that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling me this to tell me something today? That if I disagree with you as my brother, do I come and tell you you have no basis whatsoever? for your beliefs. If I have a brother who follows a marja and I follow a different marja, do I have the right to say you have no basis for whatever you do or believe? If I am called the Shia and I have a brother in Islam called Sunni, do I have the right to say you have no basis for your belief? Is that the way knowledgeable people talk? Allah is saying that's the ignorant who talks like this. Although they read the scripture, I and my brother in Islam, we both read the Qur'an. Allah is saying, look, you might be reading the scripture, you might be reading the Qur'an, but if you behave like this, you're like those, ignorant, criticized. When we read the stories of the prophets, when we read the stories of, let me say, previous nations like, for example, Fir'aun. Allah tells us about Fir'aun. 
Is that a figure in history done? Quran is talking to us about something that happened in history and done. And it will not happen again because there will never be a Fir'aun again. Is it really that's the way that we read Quran? Who's Fir'aun today? Who's Haman today? Who's Qarun today? Allah describes Fir'aun in many verses. Fir'aun claimed, I am your highest Lord. Ana rabbukum al-a'la ahsantum. Huh? Who today says that? You answer it to yourself. You're wise enough. You're informed enough. Who today talks like that? Obey me. I'm the ruler. My values are values. You are not. I am a human. You are animals. I am superior. You're inferior. For whatever reason. Who is Fir'aun today? This is a responsibility of a Muslim to identify. Who is Haman today? The powerful, the mightiest Haman. Haman, whom I think Fir'aun tells him in the Quran, Oh Haman, build me a tower so that I can reach the God of Moses. So that I can reach the God of Moses and see who this is and fight him. Ibn li sarhan la'alli attali'u ila ilahi Musa. Who's Haman today? Boasting with technological advancement, military power. Who is it? For the wrong reasons, huh? For the wrong reasons. Who's Qarun? Qarun who's got treasures. And Allah describes his treasures. That the keys to those treasures, men would find it difficult to hold them. That's how wealthy this man was. And he would say, no, it is not God who gave me this. I got it from my own knowledge, from my own advancement, from my own experiments, from my own experience. When they would tell him, oh Qarun, you've got wealth, spend it in the way of God. Don't forget your life now, it's fine, enjoy it. But remember your afterlife as well. No. Who is Qarun today? This is how we need to read the Quran. In fact, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam, Prophet Muhammad, once he alluded to something that is very particular, very beautiful. When he said, O oh Ali, anta minni bi manzilati Harun min Musa. Allah in the Quran talks about Harun and Musa multiple times. These two brothers, huh? together on the way of God, they've done so much. The Prophet would come to Ali. He could have said, O oh Ali, you to me are like my brother. You are my Khalifa. Huh? You're someone I trust. You're supportive of me and my mission. He could have kept it like this. But why saying Harun and Musa? After the fact that those lips, the blessed lips of the Prophet, uttered the verses about Harun and Musa, mentioned what the Quran said about Harun and Musa. Why? Isn't it to tell us that, look, when the Quran talks Harun and Musa, it is not talking about people who were there in history sometime and done. Isn't it to tell us that there is a Harun and Musa today? And, oh Ali, you are the Harun of today? Isn't it? Who is Harun and Musa today who are fighting Fir'aun and Haman and Qarun today? That's a question that we need to answer if we believe that the Qur'an is a book that actually addresses our challenges until the Day of Judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, and look, Allah doesn't favor people by race. Allah doesn't criticize people by their skin color. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala criticizes people or favors people by their taqwa, we all know this. And by their humility as well. As I'll mention inshallah in a minute. When Allah says about Fir'aun, إِنَّ فِرْعَوْنَ عَلَى فِي الْأَرْضِ Fir'aun has become so arrogant in the land. So arrogant. He's exalted himself in the land. وَجَعَلَ أَهْلَهَا شِيَعًا And he made the people into groups. He split the people into factions. Oppressing a sector among them. He would slaughter their newborns and would keep the females alive. Indeed, he was one of the corruptors. Allah says, this man is a corrupt person. He's a corrupter, spreading corruption. And he's transgressed. He exalted himself. He claimed to be the mightiest Lord. But is this Allah's will? Is Allah's will that these people shall remain? These people shall be victorious or these people shall win? 
Allah immediately says, and now Allah is explaining His will. وَنُرِيدُ أَن نَمُنَّ عَلَى الَّذِينَ اسْتُضَعِفُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَنَجْعَلَهُمْ أَئِمَّةً وَنَجْعَلَهُمُ الْوَارِثِينَ Our will is to confer favor upon those who were oppressed in the land. Oppressed. When you're oppressor, you know where you stand, which camp you stand with. When you're oppressed, you know which camp you stand with. And make them leaders. And make them the inheritors. They will be the victorious ones, not the arrogant, not the transgressors, not those who exalt themselves. And establish them in the land and show Pharaoh and his minister Haman what they were fearing. What they were fearing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very clearly says, look, these days, there are days that are with you, there are days that are against you. There are days that are good. There are days that are bad. But eventually, eventually, the victorious people are those who are muttaqeen. Huh? The days will change like a wheel. Yeah? One day you're at the top, one day you're at the bottom, one day you're relaxed, one day you are challenged. But in the end, who will be victorious? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the system of Allah is this. If you are pious, God conscious, God fearing, you will be victorious. No matter how the wheel turns, that becomes minor actually. Because you are with God. When you are with God, nothing can defeat you. No matter where you are in this journey. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to teach us as well that the way we look at the world in this material way, is wrong. There is one factor that we often miss. Perhaps this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent us messengers to remind us. We think that when we gain something, we're winning. Huh? When I win a contract, I'm gaining something, I'm winning. When I buy a mansion, I'm gaining something, I'm winning. When I lose a brother, someone dies, means for us or many of us that I'm losing, I'm being defeated. When my house gets demolished, I'm being defeated. Some people think this way and we have a tendency to think this way. Huh? When I'm slain on the plains of Karbala, some people think I'm defeated. When my head is paraded on the spears, from Sham to Kufa, some people think defeated. That's not the system that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa alaykum as salam, wa la tahinu wa la tahzanu. Do not weaken. Do not break down. And do not grieve. Wa antumu al a'launa in kuntum mu'mineen. Yes, challenges will face you, will hunt you down. But guess who will be the victorious? Guess who will have the upper hand? Guess who will be the exalted one? Guess who will be having the higher ground? Antumul A'laun. If it will be you, if you keep holding to your faith, if you're believers. Huh? Don't break down. Don't be weak. You're not weak. You have the highest status. If you stick to your faith. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. By all material metrics of that time. I mean, now we can challenge even these material metrics, whether Hussein was defeated or he won. Huh? By the metrics of that time, of that day, of that afternoon. By all military metrics, Hussein alayhi salam was defeated. He was annihilated. The first class followers of Ahlul Bayt, they were annihilated. This is where Imam Sajjad has they had this great responsibility to rebuild this elite class. But in the balance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us to weigh things with, no, antumul a'laun, and we see it today. Maybe some people did not see it, Banu Umayyah did not see it back then. Antumul a'laun in kuntum mu'mineen. 
you might win a job contract. You might win a million pounds. You might be victorious huh, in a match, in a battle. If you lose your faith, then you have actually lost. On the other hand, when you suffer losses, when you grieve, but if you hold on to your faith, you're a winner. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us. When we read stories from the Quran, what do we learn as well? Was Ibrahim a figure in history that was thrown into the fire and then he whispered some words and then he was safe? And that's it. We read it. We move on. Was Yunus someone who Allah is telling us like, look, this is a bedtime story. Someone went into the whale in three darknesses. He said some things and I took him out. We read it and we move on. Is that how we read the Quran? We really need to transform the way we read the Quran. Every single phrase that we read, every single name that we see has a significance. Every single land, a people, a nation that Allah is describing in the Quran, map it to today. Because it maps to your time, your place. But you have to open your eyes and find it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us the weight of faith, the weight of iman. Yes, someone might be swallowed by a whale, by a fish. Huh? By scientific metrics, this man was finished. Allah is saying, had he not been of those who exalt Allah, who do tasbih to God, he would have remained. But tasbih, that's the power of it. It can take you from the darknesses huh, of the nights in the belly of a fish in the depth of oceans. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala maybe could have made, could have explained hundreds of darknesses. But these are enough. Learn your lesson from it. Ibrahim was being thrown in the fire. Being thrown in the fire. Now if someone tells you, what would you do if this was you? I am not sure if I would say that I have my Lord with me. I don't care. I'm not sure. I hope I'd learn that lesson from Ibrahim. When you're with God, nothing can defeat you. Even when you see the danger in front of you. Even when you see people boasting in front of you with their power and might. No, when you have faith, this is nothing. You have God on your side. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wal-Asri inna al-Insan lafi khusr illa al-Ladina amanu wa amilu al-Salihat wa tawasaw bil-Haqi wa tawasaw bil-Sabr. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على محمد عبدك ورسولك وأمينك وصفيك وحبيبك وخيارتك من خلقك وحافظ سرك ومبلغ رسالاتك اللهم وصل على علي أمير المؤمنين ووصي رسول رب العالمين عبدك ووليك وأخي رسولك وحجتك على خلقك وآيتك الكبرى والنبأ العظيم وصل على الصديقة الكبرى فاطمة الزهراء سيدة نساء العالمين وصل على سبطي الرحمة وإمامي الهدى الحسن والحسين سيد شباب أهل الجنة وصل على أئمة المسلمين علي بن الحسين ومحمد بن علي وجعفر بن محمد وموسى بن جعفر وعلي بن موسى ومحمد بن علي وعلي بن محمد والحسن بن علي والخلف الهادي المهدي حججك على عبادك وأمنائك في بلادك صلاة كثيرة دائمة الله عباد الله أوصيكم ونفسي بتقوى الله والورع عن محارمه My dear brothers, my dear sisters, servants of God I enjoin myself and yourselves to observe taqwa and to stay away from what Allah has prohibited. I remember once I was giving a talk and I mentioned this thing that the Abbasid rulers, caliphate or kingdom, I don't want to call it caliphate, it is the furthest away, the furthest thing away from what could be called as caliphate. I said that the Abbasid kingdom or kingship was even more harmful to Islam and to Ahlul Bayt than the Umayyads and someone objected. And I remember that dear brother mentioned something. He said, 
But you know, the golden age of Islam, the golden age of the Muslims was at that time. So how can we say that this was illegitimate or this, <coughs> these rulers or these caliphs were illegitimate? They've done so much good. They've expanded. There was knowledge that was spread and so on. Of course, there is one key point here, and that is the ethicality or the ethical ground of things that we see or things that we read in history and we want to judge. You know, you probably know this, that the Abbasids, when they were trying to overthrow the Umayyad rulers, what was the banner? What was their motto that they held? Al-Rida min Ali Muhammad. They held that banner that we are avenging. We want to bring the right of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad in our revolution. And they tried to push Imam Sadiq alayhi salam to support them. Imam Sadiq would refuse. He knows what these people are plotting. He knows where they're heading. And actually when they established their government, one of the first things that they, they did was to slay Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. He became a threat. Imam Sadiq had this vision that these people are of that kind of caliber. The actions of later caliphs with Imam Sadiq, with Imam al-Kadhim alayhi salam, why would Imam al-Kadhim be imprisoned for tens of years, 15 years at least? Why would Imam Rada be forced to leave his home? Why would Imam Jawad too? Why would the later Imams be forced to be under house arrest, extreme surveillance? What is this? How do you draw the ethicality of this? How do you establish the moral foundation for such a rulership? Pharaoh raised Musa in his house. We all know this. Pharaoh raised the little Musa in his house. What legitimacy does this give to Pharaoh's rule? What legitimacy does it give to Pharaoh's rule? I come to you now. I steal your garden. I transform it into a beautiful mansion. I establish a scientific conference in that mansion. I invite people from all over the world to help me with the technological advancements to better humanity. I establish a clinic for mental health. I establish a gym. Does this make me the right owner of your garden? Does this make what I've done ethical? That's a question that we all need to ask ourselves when we judge what we see or when we read history. Does any good that is done by people who stole the Khilafah from the righteous people, our Imams, does it become ethical? How do you measure the ethicality of it? What is your position towards it? This was the thing that our Imams had to deal with. We need to understand this very well. Dealing with the situation as it is does not mean that you agree with the ethicality of it. Does not mean that a wrong becomes right. Allah says in the Quran, Falsehood batil can never be right. No matter how much you could sugarcoat it. The Abbasid Caliphs supported knowledge, supported this, expanded the rule of Islam. How do you materialize that ethically in the ethical system that Muhammad and Ali taught us? We are the followers of those people. That's our caliber of justice. Ali, when he would say, I would not steal a little piece of a piece of wheat from an ant. I would never do it. I would never do it. This was the level of detail about justice and ethical and morality, ethical system that we care about. Yes, that's our religiosity. We're very particular about ethics. Our religion is founded on ethics. You know, in our deen, your wudu, if you do wudu with a stolen water, your wudu is invalid. Even if you didn't have any, have any other option. You can't stand on the, on the Day of Judgment and tell God, Oh God, I didn't have, other than this water, I had to steal it and pray. You can't say that. Your prayers is invalid. If you pray to God with a piece of clothing that is stolen, your salat is invalid. Yes, ethics and legality is a big part of our deen, of our practices. When someone 
makes a transaction. When you marry someone by force or divorce by force in our deen, this is invalid. That's it. It is a big part of our religiosity to do amr bil ma'roof and nahi an munkar. We have to do nahi an munkar. It's a wajib upon us. And of course, which means we have to know the munkar first. And we shouldn't confuse the ma'roof with munkar. We shouldn't confuse the truth with falsehood. It reminds me of a hadith that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam When he said, كَيْفَ بِكُمْ إِذَا فَسُدَ نِسَاءُكُمْ وَفَسُقَ شُبَّانُكُمْ وَلَمْ تَأْمُرُوا بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَلَمْ تَنْهَوْا عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ The Prophet is talking about a later time when the Ummah would reach a stage where they would not do Amr bil Ma'roof, they would not command the good, they would stop forbidding the evil. They would stop prohibiting the evil. People were surprised, they would say, oh Rasulullah, really this would happen? He said, even worse. كَيْفَ بِكُمْ إِذَا أَمَرْتُمْ بِالْمُنْكَرِ وَنَهَيْتُمْ عَنِ الْمَعْرُوفِ Even worse, there would be a stage where you would command the evil and you would prohibit the righteousness. They were surprised this would happen, O Prophet of God. He said, even worse. كَيْفَ بِكُمْ إِذَا رَأَيْتُمُ الْمَعْرُوفَ مُنْكَرًا وَالْمُنْكَرَ مَعْرُوفًا Even worse. There would be a day where you would see the righteousness as falsehood and falsehood as righteousness. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, that he may protect us from reaching that stage. Third stage, second stage, first stage even that the Prophet described. Inshallah, we always know and understand our responsibilities. Know and understand what the munkar is, what the ma'roof is in our modern day and age. Understand those figures that Allah mentioned in the Quran. Who are they today? Who are they today? And how we take our position towards what happens around us. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل